Javier Millet uh, declared himself to be a libertarian, and not only just a libertarian, but to be an anarcho-capitalist who sees the state as a gangster organization who regards taxation as theft and who wants to cut the state down to nothing. That was his declaration. That's his self-confessed program. He mentioned, especially before he got elected, as his sources of inspiration on number one, my teacher and mentor, Murray Rosebart, and also myself. So because of that, I feel entitled to make a few, make a few remarks about this guy who is supposedly, has been supposedly being inspired also by me. Okay. Um, his victory was indeed sensational, that he was elected with a program like this in Argentina. But as Tony has explained, the background was, yes, in Argentina you had hyperinflation, you had economic stagnation, uh, increasing impoverishment, um, and given this background and given his showman talent that he definitely has with a certain element of clownishness. Um, his victory had very little to do in my assessment with Argentinians understanding any of that. Argentines are just as stupid or as smart as Germans, Englishmen, Americans and so forth. All they wanted Catastrophe is there, we want some change, and this guy promised big change. No understanding. Um, now, following his victory were some interesting developments. There were huge celebrations uh, and jubilation among the libertarians everywhere. He was awarded one award in Spain, another award in Germany, another award in, uh, in the Czech Republic. And as a president that was elected, he of course received all sorts of invitations to famous organizations. He went to Davos and all sorts of other big time conferences. Um, and there he gave some um, fired up speeches before these elite public. Um, these people listened to his speeches, but you can be pretty sure that went into one ear and went out the other ear immediately. Um, among the libertarian peanut gallery, there were of course huge excitement about it. Did you ever imagine that a guy like this would give a speech like that before an elite public? There was, there was nothing special about the speeches. Speeches like that have been given thousands of times in, in, in better way by other people. The only difference was it was a different audience. Of course, they would never invite me to Davos to give a speech. Um, <laughs> We can wait for a long time before that happened. They never would have invited Rospart to give a speech like this. But of course, I could have given a speech like that easily too. I, Rospart could has given hundreds of speeches like this. Um, and I will explain in a few minutes why I think the people listened to that by, but didn't really care much about what he said. Also, thinking back, I have not checked that. My impression was that in, during his campaign, he appeared more of an anti-statist. And during his speeches that he then gave as president, the emphasis was more on he's being an anti-socialist, not so much that he is an anti-statist. But I have not checked that. But there was a slight change in, in tone and emphasis. Um, the whole thing reminded me a little bit of 
the hoopla that you had when Obama uh, received the Nobel Prize before he even had any chance to go on killing people, murdering people, and so forth. Now, of course, this was in the opposite direction. But again, all the prizes were awarded before there was anything to show for. So in that sense, I thought there was a certain prevailing uh, parallel between the Obama phenomenon and the Milai phenomenon. So now there is obviously a time for evaluation. Now this evaluation that I will present is an evaluation that is from far away. I do not speak Spanish. I have been to Argentina years ago, but I'm not a, uh, a knowledgeable person about, um, about Argentina. Um, obviously, like all libertarians, I was excited about that whole thing. So great, wonderful, I wish him all success in, uh, in, his, in his endeavors. Um, but I was never, I never belonged to the cheerleaders in, in this group. F for that, I think I'm, I have been too long in this type of business. I have seen many big promises and then following huge, disappoint, huge disappointments. Um, and there were signs that I detected from the very beginning that made me quite skeptical and suspicious about Milai. I might talk about some of this thing a little bit later, what there's some sort of awkward things uh, went on there. Now, if we look at his accomplishments, first, internal affairs. Yes, he abolished rent controls and some other controls, but by no means all price controls. There are still price controls, for instance, for medical insurance. He liberalized the labor laws, um, and some subsidies were eliminated, but by no means all. Um, there were various deregulations passed, um, and also some privatizations occurred, but not all that many. Um, some politically correct ministries were closed, but a large part of the personnel was simply shifted to other, de to other departments. Yes, there was a certain number of people that were dismissed from public service, but by no means all. Many were just shifted from one, from one outfit um, to another outfit. Um, some taxes were lowered, but other taxes were raised, for instance, on fuel and on imports. And there were also some taxes even newly introduced. And remember, taxes are theft in, ter in terms of Millet. Um, government budget, yes, has shown a surplus, but the surplus has not led to a tax reduction. The surplus remains in the hand of the government, is further spent by the government. Um, the balancing of the budget was not only achieved by cutting expenditures, but it also was achieved by raising taxes. There was also no such thing as decentralization of power, which is a very important ingredient of, uh, of libertarian, the libertarian outlook. You give more power to the provinces, to the localities. No, his program is centralize the power uh, and limited the autonomy of the various provinces that exist in Argentina. Um, so the verdict for the internal policy, of my verdict would be that was all good, all nice, I'm all in favor of that, but that was hardly earth-shattering uh, reforms, more in the line of, let's say, Reagan or Thatcher, but in terms of the program of an anarcho-capitalist, no big deal. Then we come to monetary policy, that's even more important. No, Milay, promised that he would abolish the central bank. 
you realize that the greatest power that governments have is the monopoly power over the production of money. If they don't have that, then they would have to rely only on taxation. And if you have to rely only on taxation, then it is very difficult to get come up with the necessary money to do all the government spending. Now, remember also that Ron Paul, whose program in the United States was far less radical, at least as far as the uh, 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 talking was concerned, uh, he realized that we have to end the Fed. That's the most important program, end the Fed. No, the central bank is still in existence. Um, inflation is down, but annualized, as Tony said, is still 250% or something like, something like that. So this is an enormous inflation, even though cutting inflation is not all that difficult. You simply have to cut down, to close the central bank and print no more money than you get the inflation down in a week. Um, so central bank is still there, inflation is down. In recent months, we have already seen, again, a rapid increase in the money supply. So the printing of money by the central bank goes on. Um, and in addition, which is hardly ever mentioned, massive amounts of gold were shipped out of the country and nobody knew exactly or explained in detail where that gold went and for what purpose the shipping of gold out of Argentina occurred. Um, no, Argentinians are among those people who have the highest per capita amounts of dollars on hand because of the high inflation in Argentina, people shifted from pesos into dollars. They did their calculation and their savings all occurred in dollars. Um, but n normal, normally under hyperinflation, under inflationary conditions, a, the peso will simply disappear and the dollar will take over. That that did not occur, the reason was simply a price control as far as currencies are concerned. That is, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to buy dollars with pesos, you had to pay a tax for it. If you wanted to sell dollars in order to pay your taxes in terms of pesos, you had to pay another tax for this. This, this regime of, um, of currency price controls uh, is still in place. Um, because you are forced, uh, because of legal tender laws, um, to, you, you're forced to, um, to pay your um, taxes in, in terms of, uh, of pesos and cannot avoid these, uh, these currency controls that exist. These currency controls are, of course, a terrible regime. They, they, they hamper imports, they hamper exports, they distort the entire uh, economy. It would have been, this perfect solution has also been proposed by various people, I think by Mila himself, would have been dollarization. You simply say that the dollar and the peso compete on an even playing level. You can pay your taxes in dollars, you can pay your taxes in pesos, you can pay your taxes in terms of euros, you can pay your taxes in terms of um, uh, in, 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 ter in terms of gold, but whatever, whatever you want. Um, you simply close the central bank, no more pesos will be printed, and you leave it to the market in what type of currency people pay their taxes. Nothing like that happened. But he did say that he would do that very quickly. Now, instead, he still has a central bank, as we saw. Um, the peso is still in, yeah, in, in, in circulation next, next to the dollar. 
with, with the price controls um, that, uh, that exist. And the trust in the existing central bank is, of course, not very high in Argentina. The personnel that he employs is basically the same that created the mess that he wanted to get out of. There's a Mr. Caputo was a former central banker, and then Mr. Sturzenegger was a former central banker. All of these people studied in the United States. All of them are Keynesians. Uh, all of them served at various big banks and do the normal crap that all of these people coming out of America do in wherever they are sent to fix, fix the economy of, uh, of other people. Um, so as far as monetary affairs are concerned, that was also not a big deal. Yes, inflation is lower, but, but it's still higher than it's in Turkey. And, and, and Turkey is already a disaster in that regard. Um, so no big deal that he achieved there, much more could have, done, could have been done and much faster. And there is no trust in the central bank with a history like the history of Argentina and the same people in charge who would trust them for anything. Now, then the topic that has not been touched upon at all is the topic of uh, war and peace and foreign affairs. For Murray Rothbard, for the libertarians, that is the biggest of all questions, the question of war and peace. Any other topic diminishes in importance as compared with, are you in favor of war? Are you in favor of peace? Um, no, the traditional view of libertarians, again, represented, for instance, in this regard by uh, Ron Paul, for instance, is we take a position of a neutral country. We do not interfere in any other country's affairs. Um, and um, uh, we are aware of the fact that when we look at the world, we have to be revisionist historians. We know that we are told wrong history by our rulers. Now, Milai's worldview strikes me has about the same sophistication as that of an American high school graduate. Um, He is completely unaware of revisionist history. I doubt that he ever seriously studied Rothbard, even though he mentioned him frequently. Um, and because of that, he is not considered to be a threat by the elites. Because in foreign policy, he is just a, bra bra uh, uh, a nice boy following, following along the, the main lines. The indications. So first, he does go to the IMF, International Monetary Fund, uh, and instead of repudiating the debt, he now says, no, pacta sunt servanda, I have to be, uh, I have to just pay up to the contracts that we made. But these are not contracts. The government bonds are paid back by taxing your own population. So this is not, you don't have to keep contracts like this. These are no contracts. So they should have simply said, stupid that you are, you bought all of these government bonds, you will not get repaid. There is also no obligation of the government to repay debt to its own central bank that, that, that creates money out of thin air. This has to be simply ignored. The central bank does no longer exist. You don't care about it. You don't pay any foreign debt whatsoever. You say, no. Rothbard's argument was, a, was a, yeah, but what do people then, what will then happen? And the, his answer was, then nobody in the future will be as stupid again and ever buy government debt because they once realized it will not be repaid. That's it. Okay. Uh, that, of course, increased also 
the love for, of, for Millet by the international elite, he is going to pay all his debts. Um, and then, in addition, there is some sort of love affair between Millet and all the institutions that are responsible for all evil in the world. He loves the United States, and not and the United States, when I say the United States, I don't mean the American population, I mean the American government. So he aligns with the American government. The American government is the most imperialist country that exists, the most warlike country that exists, the country that causes trouble wherever it goes, that kills hundreds of thousands of people. So there is no more dangerous government in the world than the United States. If you simply count the people who were killed by various countries, the United States is definitely number one. So why would you just say, without any need, could just stay neutral? It's like, I don't care about foreign affairs. I just take care of Argentina. Why would you just love the United States? And why would you also love Trump? Um, he emphasized how great his admiration for Trump is. No, Trump is a buffoon. Trump is a narcissist. Trump is a protectionist. Trump is also a warrior. What, what, where do you think the weapons come from to, that, that go to uh, Ukraine and Israel and so forth? They come from the United States. Um, but he loves also Zelensky. He calls Zelensky a hero of freedom, gave him a medal. No, Zelensky is also a criminal clown who sacrifices the population of the Ukraine for a senseless war. Why does he dance in the streets with Netanyahu while Netanyahu is bombing Gaza to the ground, killing hundreds of thousands of people in the meantime. The most criminal person who currently roams around is Mr. Netanyahu, and he dances with him in the streets. Now, what type of reputation is this? Do we libertarians want to celebrate somebody as a hero who is a friend of the United States, who wants to also join NATO. Remember, you remember probably that Argentina is in the North Atlantic, because that's just, uh, he, he, bought, he bought a tremendous amount of airplanes from the United States. I'm sure that made him also many friends in the United States. He even sent some weapons to the Ukraine. And only recently he gave a speech where he said, our army has joined maneuvers with the United States in the South Atlantic. Um, and recently he gave a, gave a speech where he said, I want to just have more power given to the army. Salaries were increased for the, for the army personnel. And not only that, he said the army should also in the future take on obligations internally. That is, they should be used to fight terrorism and drug dealing and things like this. So he wants to use the army against his own population, not against foreign aggressors attacking, uh, attacking Argentina. No country in, in a long, long time has ever tried to attack Argentina. So if I, again, I know many people compare him with, yeah, with some standard politician and say, oh, he's better than many others. And undoubtedly he is. I would prefer him too over many others, no question. I prefer Trump over Kamala, even though I think both are criminals. Um, 
And I would, of course, prefer Millet over many other people, too. But from the point of view of an anarcho-capitalist, which he claims is his philosophical conviction, he is, of course, a disaster. And I cannot agree with making him, well, among libertarian circles, turning him into some sort of hero. He is not a hero. Okay, that should be, that is my, my personal view as somebody who has been mentioned by him as one of his inspirations and as somebody who knew Murray Rothbard probably better than anybody else who is currently alive. Um, and he was mentioned as his other major, well, his main inspiration. So from the point of view of a Rothbardian and a Hoppian, no, Millet is not a hero. He's better than many of the other crap that runs around, but that's about it.